Okay, and following up on the recent discussion about George Orwell and Aldous Huxley, 1984 versus Brave New World, and their respective connections to Fabian socialism and generally the direction that society is moving towards, I came across the letter that Aldous Huxley sent to George Orwell uh, after he was sent a copy of 1984. And it's been summarized by a lot of people discussing it as, I'm right, the letter from Aldous Huxley to Orwell. But it's much more than just Aldous Huxley saying he's right and his book is better than Orwell's. It's really an acknowledgement about who is on the inside track and an acknowledgement about what actual system is taking power. And I think the reason that Aldous Huxley of all people was in a position to call the shots is because his brother Julian Huxley and his pedigree with his grandfather T.H. Huxley really put him on the inside track of the elite scientific development of society. It's no exaggeration whatsoever that Julian Huxley really coined and developed and lobbied for the idea of a scientific elite being in charge, planning society, pooling studies together, and basically shaping the population, manipulating them in subtle ways, hurting them, if you will, and driving them through the larger uh, dominant social organism. And this was all an evolutionary process that was very eugenical to him. You know, he wanted a eugenical religion uh, based around science to basically take over in society. How close that mirrors the world that's actually happening? I mean, just look at it for yourself. But the point is, you know, George Orwell, a.k.a. Eric Blair, he was inside a lot of intellectual think tank circles. He knew a lot of writers. He was aware of the general politics of the day. But he didn't have the kind of inside track that Aldous Huxley had. And so basically Huxley did respond to Orwell and tell him, Good job, my former pupil. Your book's excellent, but it's also wrong and mine's coming true and here's why. But let's look at what he actually said. And this has been thoroughly published. It's in the archive of the letters between them. And it was a, a letter that Huxley sent to Orwell dated October 21st, 1949. Uh, while he was living in California, which he did for many, many years, uh, Wrightwood, California. Dear Mr. Orwell, it was very kind of you to tell your publishers to send me a copy of your book. It arrived as I was in the midst of a piece of work that required much reading and consulting of references, and since poor eyesight makes it necessary for me to ration my reading, I had to wait a long time before being able to embark on 1984. Now, Huxley was nearly blind. He had terrible eyesight, but he's also clearly putting Orwell off here. At any rate, he goes on. Agreeing with all that the critics have written of it, I need not tell you yet once more how fine and how profoundly important the book is. Good job, Orwell. May I speak instead of the thing with which the book deals, the ultimate revolution? So after just a passing sentence, Alice Huxley changes the subject from 1984 uh, back to his own work with Brave New World, Again, to, you know, teach the pupil uh, of what he supposedly missed here. It's not a blow I expect Orwell took well, but at any rate, Huxley wrote, The first tense of a philosophy of the ultimate revolution, the revolution which lies beyond politics and economics, and which aims at total subversion of the individual's psychology and physiology, are to be found in the Marquis de Sade, who regarded himself as the continuator, the consummator, of Robespierre and Babouf of the French Revolution. The philosophy of the ruling minority in 1984 is a sadism which has been carried to its logical conclusion by going beyond sex and denying it. Whether in actual fact the policy of the boot on the face can go on indefinitely seems doubtful. I mean, clearly Huxley is saying he thinks Orwell's wrong here. My own belief is that the ruling oligarchy will find less arduous and wasteful ways of governing and of satisfying its lust for power. And these ways will resemble those which I described in Brave New World. Again, saying he's right. But here's where I think it gets interesting. I've had occasion recently to look into the history of animal magnetism and hypnotism, and have been greatly struck by the way in which, for 150 years, the world has refused to take serious cognizance of the discoveries of Mesmer, Braid, Esdell, and the rest. 
partly because of the prevailing materialism and partly because of the prevailing respectability, 19th century philosophers and men of science were not willing to investigate the odder facts of psychology for practical men, such as politicians, soldiers, and policemen, to apply in the fields of government. Thanks to the voluntary ignorance of our fathers, the advent of the ultimate revolution was delayed for five or six generations. Another lucky accident was Freud's inability to hypnotize successfully and his consequent disparagement of hypnotism. This delayed the general application of hypnotism to psychiatry for at least 40 years. But now psychoanalysis is being combined with hypnosis, and hypnosis has been made easy and indefinitely extensible through the use of barbiturates, which induce a hypnoid and suggestible state in even the most recalcitrant subjects. Within the next generation, I believe the world's rulers will discover that infant conditioning and narco-hypnosis are more efficient as instruments of government than clubs and prisons, and that the lust for power could be just as completely satisfied by suggesting people into loving their servitude as by flogging and kicking them into obedience. In other words, I feel that the nightmare of 1984 is destined to modulate into the nightmare of a world having more resemblance to that which I imagined in Brave New World. The change will be brought about as a result of a felt need for increased efficiency. Meanwhile, of course, there may be a large-scale biological and atomic war, in which case we shall have nightmares of other and scarcely imaginable kinds. Thank you once again for the book. Yours sincerely, Aldous Huxley. And so that's not only the note on a personal relationship between two important influential authors that almost every grade school student is exposed to and asked to write essays about, and it's not just two anchors, Huxley and Orwell, that become almost goalposts of uh, one type of dystopic society or another uh, that's in some ways shaping our future. I mean, the huge influence of 1984 as a dark vision of the future and a brave new world as a society that is happy on the surface but loses its humanity and its free will you know, these are goalposts. Things can be the iron fist or the velvet glove. It could be the ultimate revolution, one extreme or another. I mean, these are goalposts on an Overton window, the concept of changing politically acceptable possibilities. But between both extremes, between Democrat and Republican, both extremes converge into the window of publicly acceptable range of possibilities. The unthinkable on one side and the unthinkable on the other, uh, when they're introduced, become merely radical. And at some point within the window, they shift to acceptable. And if things shift from radical to acceptable, then it makes the idea of it being sensible possible, when it was once unthinkable. And it sets the stage for it to even become not only uh, recommended and sensible, but popular and actual policy. Overton window was coined for Joseph P. Overton, who stated that an idea's political viability depends mainly on whether or not it falls within the range of politically acceptable policies, according to mainstream opinion. But, you know, this is the story about the technology itself of government. A science, yes, but a science of conditioning and hypnotizing the human being for the purposes of governing them, for the purposes of shaping society. He uses terms, instruments of government. Day. Norbert Wiener's cybernetic concept held the key as to what they should do with the digital computers they had developed. The method and the signal are such that they must be fed to the transmitter in a series of positive decisions. It fused together the working principles of the biological organism, looping systems that maintained equilibrium. Its maintenance is automatic and seeks to balance any disturbances. They had a universal mechanism to create goal-seeking behavior that made machines and even people basically programmable. On the influence of a feedback system, I mean, it's very interesting the words that Huxley uses here. He hones in on the individual's psychology and physiology, the operations of the mind, the brain mechanism, as well as the nervous system itself that works throughout the body. 
I mean, even just casually reading this letter, it seems hugely important that he honed in on the phrases psychology and physiology. He wants to use hypnosis and infant conditioning. I mean, this is pure cybernetics. If you've seen The Minds of Men, in the cybernetic section, we detail the first meeting in 1942, Macy's hosted a, a convergence around cerebral inhibition. You know, you could read that as how to get an individual to not use their mind. And while in hindsight, it's been connected with a sort of MK Ultra spy versus spy context, the real context here is purely Brave New World, psychology and physiology, the two key topics of the first Macy's cerebral inhibition meetings became the cornerstones of cybernetics along with Norbert Wiener's key concept of feedback of the purpose-driven system. Wiener stated, The existing natural reflexes are essentially part of the same mechanism that can inform all purposeful activity in automata. One need merely supply a circuit with receptors and effectors. Then they become goal-seeking devices. Right. Uh, so there's actually three pillars, but you know, you get a long way with the psychology of hypnosis and the physiology of conditioning. The two keynote speakers of this meeting were Milton Erickson, who was showing a practical hypnotism that he uses on his patients, and that he said in some of his speeches can also be used to implant ideas and give sort of compartmentalized instructions. You can ask a subject to develop an amnesia for certain experiences, or certain classes of experiences, for certain attitudes, for certain learnings, because in the hypnotic trance, then you need merely to direct the ideas to which the subject is to respond. And the other key presentation was by Howard Liddell, who was continuing Pavlovian conditioning research and reporting on the state of the conditioned reflex. Howard Liddell used the techniques of conditioned response that Pavlov had developed to study the central nervous system and emotions. I'm uh, myself somewhat of a uh, uh, disciple of Pavlov. Okay, that's the physiology of the nervous system and the psychology of hypnosis. You know, when those two are combined, it becomes uh, very important to cybernetic control. In other words, control within a scientific society. You know, how do you keep people at bay? How do you keep them placated? Well, you appeal to their psychology and their physiology. You know, you keep those two above board and you have control. You don't have to have the boot in the face. That's the argument that Huxley's making. And again, I don't think it's any coincidence that Aldous Huxley was so, quote, prescient in his 1931 Brave New World book. You know, it bears upon his relationship to his evolutionary biologist slash social planner, Julian Huxley. Uh, who was way on the inside track, as was their grandfather who promoted Darwinism. I mean, there was a lot of things Julian Huxley wrote, but uh, one of them was published in 46 in his treatise on UNESCO, and he basically writes about cybernetics as well without calling it cybernetics. Uh, he says, quote, A more restricted problem in which biological analogy is important is that of social organization in general and the machinery of government in particular the machinery of government, the instrument of government. As I have already pointed out, social organization is the mechanism on which man must rely to affect evolutionary progress, and government is the central part of this mechanism, because the government steers. As the problems of government grow more complex, so must the machinery for dealing with them. In general, the problems are similar to those which beset a higher animal and are met by means of its central nervous system. A higher vertebrate must coordinate the activities of its various different organs and adjust the claims of its different innate impulses. It needs mechanisms for providing information about its environment, especially changes in it and correlating different kinds of information, for storing experiences and profiting by it and for appropriate action. You know, these are the problems of the modern society as the super organism, you know, the government steered social organism that includes man as a component of it. 
You know, this is based around cybernetic physiology and psychology, the shaping of the mental conditions and the environment perceived by the people in the system. It's all about, <laughs> it's all about corralling perceptions and, you know, the actual conditions, the true servitude of one's uh, state of being is not really what's in question. What's in question is the relative happiness of the perception of those individuals in the system. That's the major difference that Huxley hints at in Brave New World when he talks about loving one's servitude, loving conditions that one shouldn't. But basically, it's all played upon nervous system. It's all a central nervous system you know, of the individual, of the biological organism, and of the information society, the internet-based network of people, okay? At any rate, and the corollaries between Julie and Huxley's writing as a UNESCO figure, as a scientific organization figure, as a eugenicist, directly parallel the things that Aldous Huxley talked about, especially in his 1958 Brave New World Revisited, where he took all the themes of Brave New World and basically explained how they're all nonfiction and they're all part of this uh, basic system that's unfolding. And, you know, just a look at the contents is pretty revealing. Uh, this is Brave New World Revisited. Chapter 1, Overpopulation. 2, Quantity, Quality, Morality. 3, Overorganization. 4, Propaganda in a Democratic Society. 5, Propaganda under a Dictatorship. Hint, they operate pretty similarly. 6, The Arts of Selling. 7, Brainwashing. 8, Chemical Persuasion, 9, Subconscious Persuasion, 10, Hypnopedia, 11, Education for Freedom, and 12, What Could Be Done. Now, if you weren't paying attention, everything from propaganda to arts of selling to brainwashing to chemical persuasion to subconscious persuasion to hypnopedia to education for freedom are all forms of mind control based around the previous problems of overpopulation, overorganization, and dealing with quantity, quality, and morality. Okay, this is all about steering and shaping society. And so it's not even that surprising when Huxley lays it out in Chapter 11, so-called Education for Freedom, <laughs> uh, you know, a little taste of what's going on here. And this is on page 108, at least in my edition. In the brave new world of my fable, socially desirable behavior was ensured by a doable process of genetic manipulation and postnatal conditioning. Babies were cultivated in bottles, and a high degree of uniformity in the human product was assured by using ova from a limited number of mothers and by treating each ovum in such a way that it would be split and split again, producing identical twins in batches of a hundred or more. In this way, it was possible to produce standardized machine minders for standardized machines. The standardization of the machine minders was perfected after birth by infant conditioning, hypnopedia, which is sleep learning, you know, like tapes playing while you sleep or whatever, and chemically induced euphoria as a substitute for the satisfaction of feeling oneself free and creative. Vast impersonal forces are making for the centralization of power and a regimented society. They are doing it. The genetic standardization of individuals is still impossible, but big government and big business already possess or will very soon possess all the techniques for mind manipulation described in Brave New World. They already possess mind manipulating techniques, along with others of which I was too unimaginative to dream. I'm sure Huxley just couldn't think of it. Lacking the ability to impose genetic uniformity upon embryos, the rulers of tomorrow's overpopulated and overorganized world will try to impose social and cultural uniformity upon adults and their children. To achieve this end, they will, unless prevented, make use of all the mind-manipulating techniques at their disposal and will not hesitate to reinforce these methods of non-rational persuasion by economic coercion and threats of physical violence. If this kind of tyranny is to be avoided, he says tongue-in-cheek in a disingenuous, I'm in on it kind of fashion, in order to avoid this kind of tyranny, we must begin without delay to educate ourselves and our children 
for freedom and self-government. In the negative, you have described in my story, man has been subordinated to his own inventions. Science, technology, social organization, these things have ceased to serve man. They have become his masters. So, I mean, <laughs> this is not some crank or theorist. This is Aldous Huxley saying they do have and will use mind manipulation techniques. Do have, will use, and they have an eye to the future of genetic engineering and standardization. Of course, that was again, you know, 90 years ago almost. So. Oh, something that was supposed to go click, click started going clack, clack. But naturally, I wouldn't know what. And how lucky we are to be gamma. After all, to be good is gamma because gamma is good. As select alphas, conditioned to believe without knowing and to know without believing, you have been chosen to view the surrogate revelations and synthetic mysteries upon which all perfect and placebic belief is founded. This is about the basic power drive, and they know that in this system you have no real power, so the power has to be sublimated with idle pleasures, hobbies, sports, and uh, basically false talents and false achievements and little rabbit holes for people to get themselves stuck in. But the whole concept itself, you know, using this feedback mechanism of self-indulgence, this larger concept is purely cybernetic. They want to produce, ideally anyway, human beings who are socially conditioned to become standardized machine minders for standardized machines. Of course, we know by today's standards that the standardized machines are doing most of the minding, uh, not so much the other way around, but... Everyone is adjusted. Everyone has been conditioned to want to do the work he has to do. We're not too stupid and we're not too bright. To be a gamma is to be just right. And thus, everyone is perfectly happy, perfectly content. Deltas all have lots of fun. Deltas get to play and run. The point is, the shaping of human beings for the society of the future, for the scientifically managed society, is rather pronounced. And, and Huxley has such a sly way of acknowledging that the science has actually been around a lot longer than people are aware of. It's basically been suppressed because these sciences have been ridiculed in past centuries. And, and that actually is a really interesting sub part of this whole ordeal, where he acknowledges that you know, about 150 years passed by where nobody would take seriously the idea of hypnotism because of the smear basically against mesmerism and the resistance to any of these other scientists and doctors who were trying to relieve pain during surgery, that kind of thing. Uh, that's especially true of James Braid and James Asdale that he names, you know, that they refuse to take a serious look at it. I'm a doctor of the Viennese Faculty of Medicine. My name is Franz Anton Mesmer. <laughs> doctor, you flatter us. Joseph Balsamo had captured the interest of Dr. Mesmer, who was striving in vain for the scientific recognition of his great discovery, the curative powers of hypnotism. And without really taking a deep dive into it, it's really interesting how sort of disingenuous that was. You know, the discrediting of Mesmer's animal magnetism in the late 18th century. Uh, he had a very big following. It's even been said in some of these newspaper accounts that, quote, one out of four doctors were mesmerist. There were crowds being attracted to basically see Mesmer treat, or if you look at it the other way around, uh, perform, you know, his sort of act and um, let people who are basically highly suggestible to begin with feel like they have these effects. You know, that was kind of the public perception put on mesmerism. As Huxley points out, there is and always was something to it. You know, to what degree was Mesmer a uh, charlatan and showman? You know, I'm not going to get into that level of it, but the underlying basis for his animal magnetism uh, was at least sound to some degree. Joseph, without knowing it, for years, you have been practicing hypnotism. Hypnotism? Yes. I never even heard of the word. <laughs> Very few have. <laughs> but it's an art which was forgotten when the world grew old. Was his actual treatment itself, uh, the full articulation of that, 
I don't know the full story, um, but it is interesting because Mesmer was actually an associate of Adam Weishaupt of the very real group Bavarian Illuminati. He was in France in the pre-revolutionary days, and a lot of sources have gone a long way to establish the connection between the Bavaria Germany-based Illuminati and the events leading up to the French Revolution. There's definitely a connection there. And Mesmer was often said to be sort of a screen for attracting elite and talented men and women uh, by putting on public talks. They were widely attended. And then basically recommendations could be made behind the scenes for people who might be of use further within the organization. That said, it's very interesting that Mesmer did a lot of his work with the glass harmonica because it was invented by Benjamin Franklin. What we've got here is a scaled down version. It, it is original, although that, for example, is 37 bowls. This is 25. So I'm just going to give you the sound of it. Right, so when that was played properly by the real people at the time, it was fingers in water, dipped into chalk, and then you played sort of little ten fingers across at the time, so you could make a far more harmonious sound than that. And because Benjamin Franklin was one of the people assigned to the panel, the Royal Medical Panel, to investigate Mesmer and ultimately to discredit him. Mesmer uses Franklin's invention to put people in a trance. Fra while he's in France, because uh, Mesmer is a Frenchman, while uh, Franklin is in France, he's part of a committee that investigates Mesmer, Mesmer. and they then decide he's a fraud. It was an appointed body of King Louis the Sixteenth, and ironically or not, it also included Dr. Guillotine, whose name was later applied to the guillotine. Uh, it had the chemist Antoine Lavoisier, the astronomer Jean Sylvain Bailey, and the American ambassador and scientist Benjamin Franklin, uh, who knew Mesmer and who had uh, at least an acquaintanceship with him. And there were sort of conflicting ideas about the mental effects of the glass harmonica and the effect of animal magnetism and on and on. I think you're on the right track with that. <laughs> that, cool. that was good. <laughs> so the sound is a little bit weird. Um, sometimes people find it a bit nerve wracking. But at the end of the day, they did a blindfold test of a man who supposedly claimed to be under the effects of mesmerism, but couldn't even distinguish between whether the practitioner was there or not. And quite frankly, what I remember of the story seemed like kind of a snow job, a whitewash uh, investigation just to kind of shut down public credibility for Mesmer. And at the end of the day, his work had some kind of legitimate scientific basis that was ignored uh, publicly. Publicly, it was discredited. And despite the affiliation of lots of scientific men of the day, uh, was discredited. And yet, all these years later, people still think it's discredited when hypnotism and its basis in mesmerism have been upheld. They've been demonstrated. It's become easy to do, and it's clinically significant. It's not just a circus uh, stage trick, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's just amazing because I think the public mind associates hypnotism in the same way that it was meant to associate mesmerism as sort of a stage trick an exercise in public gullibility, you know, in, incredible claims and everything. And yet hypnotism is a reliable, legitimate part of psychotherapy of various kinds. And it just basically reflects a state of suggestibility that's easily achieved not only with drugs, as Huxley mentions, but with the television, with the actual signal. Videodrome signal will ultimately produce and control hallucination to the point that it will change human reality. Videodrome is a bioelectronic addiction. It's clear you have a history of manipulation. And I think it's significant indeed that Huxley goes on to argue that Orwell, while he presents a good book in 1984, is ultimately wrong because all the effort, all the inefficient means of kicking and flogging people into obedience would ultimately 
modulate into the nightmare of Brave New World. It would modulate into a world dominated by the domination of psychology and physiology and cybernetics. It would modulate from a 1984 Iron Fist tyranny into one that was bureaucratically invisible, into one that appeased people at a physiological and psychological level into believing they were in a blissful state when they're not. We shall and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. They modulate. It's an instrument of government. Modulate. When you look up the dictionary definition of modulate, and I think I've got the 1941 edition in front of me, it says, it reads, to adjust or regulate by a certain proportion. It gets things into a certain proportion. A temper, to soften. Definition two, to tune to a certain key or pitch. Vary or change the frequency as of an electrical wave by imposing upon them others or another, usually of a lower frequency. As a verb, to modulate the tones as in singing. In music, to pass by regular chord or melodic progression as from one key to another. In radio, to produce modulation. The modulation of the 1984 tyranny system into the Brave New World system is literally shifting the instrument of government, the tuning of the mechanism that governs society. It's a shift of key. It's a shift of musical frequencies, very much at a Pythagorean sense that the universe is made up in chords and specific frequencies. You know, Huxley is talking about such a shift psychologically and physiologically that it's a modulation into the other world. It's a shifting of keys. You know, it's not just that Orwell missed a few notes, if you will, because of things he didn't know. It's that he didn't understand the way in which the instrument of the system could change its key altogether to be more harmonious, to be more resonant with the larger social organism that they wanted to build and to put people in harmony with that. I think that's very interesting. I think it's very interesting indeed. Kitchen. E flat. Why do people act the way they do? There's a reason. This is you. You resonate on an ultra low frequency. She resonates on an ultra high frequency. I don't want her to be an experiment. Sound influences the way that people connect with each other. He is literally out of sync with the natural world. There's something deeper at work. You are a slave born into a prison for your mind. I mean, they're not conscious of it, but it's there. This was all about conditioning and hypnotizing people. It's about getting people used to a state and nervous physiological sense and about making them suggestible to accept that state and combining those uh, many times over. Within the next generation, I believe the world's rulers will discover that infant conditioning and narco-hypnosis are more efficient as instruments of government than clubs and prisons and that the lust for power can be just as completely satisfied by suggesting people into loving their servitude as by flogging and kicking them into obedience. In other words, George Orwell, I'm right, you're wrong. That's Aldous Huxley in 1949. And as it happens, George Orwell did not live very much longer. Uh, he died the next year in 1950, only two or three months after receiving this letter in October 1949 from Huxley, who had once been his tutor in French at the Eton boarding school, and who was very much his sort of mentor and supposed superior in the intellectual circles of Britain. And um, for all the merits of Orwell's book, this letter was a very in-your-face admission that, no, 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 Huxley's on the inside track, and they have something else planned for us. This is very much about an elite, secretive scientific body calling the shots. And Julian Huxley himself talked about this. 
This paper, Julian Huxley and the Continuity of Eugenics in the 20th Century Britain, besides being really interesting anyway, from 2015, makes the point several times over that, quote, Julian Huxley was interested in establishing an international network of elite intellectuals. Huxley organized a study group to, quote, study the problem of a possible new ideology appropriate to the present situation of society at large. Huxley wanted this to be an interdisciplinary and yet also a secret and anonymous group linking high-powered thinkers with practical activities. You know, these are the advisory boards that make minute decisions about policy topics ranging from A to Z, you know, that are too dull for the public to even know about and uh, which the public doesn't have the purview or the jurisdiction to even influence. You know, this is about an elite body here. And it says, this was Huxley in elitist mode. In my opinion, just about the only mode he knows. You know, that's Julian Huxley. And I just don't think that Alice Huxley fell all that far from the family tree there. The things they wrote about very much overlapped. And again, Julian Huxley's agenda lines up pretty directly uh, with Brave New World Revisited and with the original Brave New World. So anyway, pretty interesting, I think. Very good. But do you wish you had been incubated as alphas? No, no. Excellent. That's all.